What's up, guys? Welcome back to another Accidentally Intentional podcast episode. Guys, I am thrilled for this conversation today because we have an enigma, a gem, a diamond in the rough. We have Sean Killensworth on the show today. And wait till you hear his story. I'm obsessed with what he's doing, his heartbeat, his passion, and how he wants to, quite honestly, change the world. So, Sean, welcome to the show. Thank you, Zoe. Good to see you. Good to meet you. Yes. Happy to be here. I know. But now we're friends just like that. We were chatting it up a little bit before we started recording. And I was like, let's just let's just let everyone else hear our banter live. So, Sean, I heard about you because you were on a thousand hours outside podcast and you have a fascinating story. And so I want you to kind of give people a quick little summary of who you are, what you do and what brought you to this moment right now. Great question. So, um, like you said, I'm Sean. Hi everyone. And I am 20 years old. I went to, I graduated high school 2021 and I, when I went to high school, I was all excited for friends and dates and flyers in the hallway for parties and like Halloween parties, all the keg stands, stuff like that. Like, you know, late night adventures, stuff like these. And when I got to high school, I experienced a lot of Snapchat, a lot of group chats, a lot of Instagram, a lot of texting, and a lot less of in-person, going on adventures, meeting people, talking. People were more reserved and more attached to their phones than I ever thought was going to happen. And I felt robbed after watching all these 80s movies going into high, like going into high school, excited for 16 Candles and Pretty in Pink and all this stuff. And I, it didn't feel right. And I personally was like, all right, well, I'll solve this problem and I'll just get rid of my phone. I'll get a flip phone. So when I was 15, I got rid of my phone entirely and got a flip phone. Wow. It was mixed reviews from the people in my high school class, but- when I took that final step, that most extreme step, because I had tried to knock on my phone, whatever, I was still addicted, redownload the apps, everything like that. But when I got a flip phone, I noticed, and it was shocking, but I noticed how everyone else was on their phone. When I didn't have a phone to turn to and I had no social media presence and I wasn't participating at all, it really showed how constantly people were on their phones at my school. Like I would, I would walk in in the morning, everyone would be walking on their phone. Everybody's sitting down on their phone. I'd be waiting for class to start. Everybody would be on their phone and I, I would be looking up the whole day. So that's when I realized that it couldn't just be me that put down my phone. It would have to be a group of people because if just I put down my phone, I just look up to a sea of people not participating in the present moment with me. So that's why I started the reconnect movement because I realized it has to be a movement of parents, of high schoolers, of college kids, all putting down their phones together to enjoy socializing in the moment without the distraction of our phones. It's beautiful. And this entire conversation we're going to have today, Sean, is about our relationship with our phones and screen time and social media and isolation. And I kind of want to dig into and let people feel what you're feeling when you enter high school, you get your flip phone mm -hmm. because you're, you're trying to be proactive, right? You're like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to help myself first and I'm going to have the discipline and know that I don't need it. And then you walk in and you're in a wasteland, as you call it. What are you feeling in that moment? Are you scared? Like, is this becoming a really frightening thing that you're seeing? And you're like, I actually have never felt more alone. Like, take us to that moment. Man, yeah, no, it was it was dark for a while, and it was definitely worse before it got better. Mm. Um, I I went into school because I was like, I solved this, I figured it out, I got a flip phone, you know, like I took all the steps that I could for my own personal control over myself. Sure. So I just was like, I can't wait to live my '80s dream at school now. And then it was it was mainly depression because I realized that it was out of my hands and I saw because the way that I looked at it in that moment when I got my flip phone thinking I fixed the problem 
and then I went and saw the real problem. Mm. I was just sad. And it wasn't because I didn't think I could fix it, which is, I'm crazy. So I saw that and I was like, I can fix this. I will fix this. I'm going to start a movement. It's all going to be different. You'll see. Yeah. That was, what, that was my first thought, but still past that. Cause I, I knew that was going to be five, eight years away in my gut. And so really, I just was mourning the fact that my high school was going to be like this because it was, I was my freshman year was going into high school. And that was, I, I just, there was nothing I could do about it then. And I, you only get high school once, yeah. you know, you, I, years I'm going to be out of high school. It's going to be the same. Yeah. So it was definitely worse before it got better, but not to discourage people from doing that or make it seem like it was all bad because eventually through that, I found a friend group. And that friend group was essential for that time in my life because it was so hard to meet new friends without Snapchat. Mm. It was so hard to meet and make new friends without Snapchat and Instagram that I found this friend group. We just hung out all the time and they totally adopted my flip phone thing. They didn't care. And one of the cool things that I saw from being a leader and getting a, a flip phone was in this friend group, they all used to text each other and it was all, you know, a pain and it's, it takes time and no one responds. I just called everybody. I never texted. I couldn't text on a flip phone. So I just called everybody. And slowly the culture of the friend group moved to everyone was constantly calling each other. And it was always calling changed the culture of our friend group. And it was, it was nice. And then eventually senior year, I met a whole group that were all about the reconnect ideology that were barely took videos on their phone. We're always off their phone. We hung out. We got to have parties together and play board games together. And I ended up getting that experience I wanted in the end. But it was that first moment was very sad. Wow. Okay. There's so much to dig into in what you just said. And one thing I just want to call out that I love that you say on your Instagram page, and we can talk about your use with social media later, but you call yourself the reverse Mark Zuckerberg. And I think that's <laughs> brilliant. Can you explain why you say that and how going through this dark time in high school, you actually in that moment had the awareness and the hope inside of you to say, I want to be part of the solution because I think that's rare. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that my grand vision for the future is one reason I like to say the, to be honest, it was just a random joke I thought of one day. I was like, that's kind of funny. I'll put that way. It makes here. sense. But yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the, th the two things that mainly line it up are my, my grand vision for the future, which I believe, I believe that, reconnect and social media will be hand in hand one day because a lot of people mm. think my message is put down your phones, get rid of your phone, get a flip phone, delete social media. Social media is bad. Social media is this, that, but that's not my message. My message is actually that we just need balance with social media. Social media is the way of the future. We can, we can spread all these widespread ideas to audiences like that. We don't need managers. We don't need big corporations. We ourselves, the people can spread our message and our, our meaning to the world. That's a beautiful, amazing thing. And among many other amazing things, with social media, we just aren't balancing it the same way mm -hmm. that would meet, that would help us have healthy human connection in our lives, specifically in our, our generation. So that's one of the things I think that I will be up with Mark Zuckerberg in a way, you know, hand in hand with the balance of in-person real life connection and online digital connection. So that's one reason. And then another thing is I started the movement and I called it the reconnect movement. And then eventually I realized I was like, I need to get rid of the, the and I need to just make it reconnect movement. And Facebook started out as the Facebook yeah. they got and started Facebook. And, uh, and then also my friends just, he, when he was coming up, he was super young and he was in this tech space wearing like, you know, pajama pants and sandals and t-shirts to these giant billion dollar Silicon Valley meetings. Yeah. And everyone was like, who is this? And it set this whole trend. And my friends just like make fun of my style sometimes for being lackadaisical or look like a homeless person or like what I dress. So it was kind of like a combination of that. It just clicked in my head. I thought it was funny. Yeah, I love that. So um, let, let's, let's unpack what reconnect movement does in colleges right now. So people have a, a framework for that. Sure. Yeah, of course. So what we are currently doing is starting clubs on college campuses 
through an inspired student that wants to have a phone free community on their campus. And what that looks like is we have one club at Rollins right now. We have one club at UCF, University of Central Florida, and we are opening up two more clubs this spring at UF and FSU, so Florida State and University of Florida. And those are groups that get together every other week. We have events that are, they're not super grandiose, like we're going to go to Disney or we're going to do this. It is all centered around essentially hanging out together, doing a fun activity like painting or, you know, we have one event that's literally called Just Talking and everybody puts their phones away and we just hang out and we experience life together without the distraction of our phones. And that, to be honest, is enough mm. with with uh, with an activity. So the goal is to w- basically give students an opportunity to build friendships, spend time off their phones in person together, because right now social media has a bit of a monopoly on social connection in our generation. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, like I said, if I delete Snapchat, I have a really hard time making friends. And a lot of people that have joined the specifically the reconnect Rollins group and UCF actually both have said fresh as their freshman year coming into um, college, Their senior year, they were deleting their Instagram, their Snapchat, whatever. And then they came into college and they were trying to make friends and they had to re-download it. Even though they don't like it, they had to re-download it to make friends. So we want to be that opportunity for students that they don't want to have to make friends through social media because social media can have negative effects on your mental health, on your overall feeling about yourself, you know, to have that in-person option. Man. You're speaking my language. So I want to tell you about my college experience because uh, this was 10 years ago. So I basically had a best friend breakup, which for girls, it's like very bad. Like people choose sides. It's like a whole thing. And so I had one best friend, lost that best friend and was like, I have no friends. So mind you, this is 10 years ago. Social media is on the come up. We're making Facebook friends. We're making, you know, Instagram is becoming a thing at this point. And I'm looking at this, scrolling through and being like, I don't know any of these people. Like, I just know their names. I can say hide them if I pass them. But what I ended up doing was I made a New Year's resolution for myself to eat a meal with someone different every single day on the college campus and get to know their name and their story. And it ended up being such a profound experience that I continued it my final two and a half years of college and got over 250 different meal dates on the college campus. And it was a brutal experience at first because I was like, I'm so awkward. It was, it was to the point that I actually wrote out note cards and put them in my pocket for potential questions if there was awkward oh. silence. And I remember that that experience changed me, changed everything about how I interact with people because I learned so many things and that it's one, we are all craving for human connection. Even even to the point that we will take fake versions of it on social media. Mm -hmm. Now, to the point of AI, people are literally taking fake connection with a robot over the potential of talking to another human being. And it's just fascinating because you talked about how there was a lot of depression that like even you went through experiencing and going to a flip phone and being like, I'm alone on an island. But yet at the same Mm -hmm. time, everyone is feeling alone on an island, putting their head in a phone, trying to find the connection Mm -hmm. while isolating themselves from the connection that's literally right in front of them. So let's talk Mm -hmm. about that. T- tell me how how this interaction happens when you go on college campuses and you're like, hey, we're the phone free club. Welcome. <laughs> People are probably yeah. like, oh, why would I want to do that? I have all my friends right here. Like, what what are the reactions from people? Yeah, so definitely mixed reviews. Some people are like, what? Yeah. You're crazy. I would never do that. You're weird. That's that, that was, and that was what I got in high school. I got a ton of hate when I first started in high school. Like 
um, to be fair, college students are a little better about like judging stuff, but yeah, some people though are like, finally, like finally someone's doing this. Like they feel it because they see that what you are talking about, which is everyone's alone on an island denying us this connection yeah. that could be all around us. So some people see it. So when they hear phone free club, they're like, count me in. They're, they're in immediately, you know? So we've had, and we've had a lot more of that the second semester at Rollins. Mm. So the first semester is more, everybody's like, is that real? Like, it's so crazy that they're not sure that it's actually legit. Wow. And they have no idea what to, because it's so abnormal, mm-hmm. especially in this generation. Mm-hmm. And so it's a radical idea. Sure. But the second semester, we've had a lot more freshmen show up where they're like, oh my gosh, yes, finally, this is happening. So it's total opposite ends of the spectrum. And then there's a lot of people who also who join want to be a part of the club, but their social anxiety or their fear of being around people and knowing they'll be forced to interact without any escape of their phone, Mm -hmm. they're too afraid to really come to an event. And that's something that we tried to address this semester. Like, Hey guys, we're, we're meant to be a, you know, a soft pillow for your social anxiety. We're meant to just be here. No judgment, you know, you need to be yourself and, Really, you're under way more constant scrutiny when you're online than you are in person. So we have mixed reviews, but uh, definitely everyone talks about it. Like at, by now, everyone at Rollins has heard about the phone free club, you know, and it's a small school. It's like 3000. But so, yeah, I think that's incredible because one of my questions was going to be, how the heck do you promote this in a culture where everything needs to be recorded or it didn't happen and we need to post reels as a recap for the event so people can like it, share it, and then it goes into the abyss. You have obviously done no social media marketing because that would be antithetical. So how has that worked for you? Well, I actually, well, I haven't done intense social media marketing, but I do have grams for all my clubs got it let me go into that because a lot of people are like well that's ironic yeah no social media person it goes back to what i was saying earlier earlier social media is the way of the future it's going nowhere it is a technological advancement that is a is ultimately even though it's hurting us right now it will be a net positive Mm -hmm. and so i believe that using social media in a balanced way especially for something like this so for example here's how i use social media to market and then i'll go into the other ways that i market as well but the way I market the social media is just, I never like post anything except a picture, a group picture of the group that went to the event. Mm-hmm. And then I put the date, what we did, and then the link to the like WhatsApp group chat for the group. Brilliant. And then if we, if we get our hands on a digital camera, then we can take pictures throughout the event, but we only take a few, you know, and then we post some, some pictures, but I play off of the fact that we can't we don't post anything. We don't take videos. We don't do anything like that yeah. because it, it, I think it adds to a positive FOMO effect mm. where mm. people are like, Oh man, like, I wonder what happens at these events. It's a mystery. Like there's no way to know unless I go in person. So then it, it is, is using social media as a way to drive people to in-person connection. So I kind of see it as you know, have you ever seen the matrix? Yes. So you know how you have to go into the matrix to pull people out yeah. of the matrix. Wow. That's what I'm doing, essentially. Because that's where everybody is. Everybody's on social media. Yeah. So. Sean, I think you're a master marketer already. You definitely, you definitely are, are tapping into something with that. Um, I wanna I wanna get real raw here for a second. Let's do it. Uh depression rates, anxiety rates, and suicide rates for teenagers and young 20s are through the roof. Everyone's pointing to and pointing the finger at social media is doing that. But, you know, you talk often when you're in these conversations about how it's not one or the other, but there's actually a third way. Can you talk about steps that someone can take to have a more balanced relationship with screen time and all of that? Yes. So the, the key thing that I believe, the thing that I focus on, I think it's a mixture of all things mm-hmm. that, that you just said of social media, you know, screen time, all these things, content addiction, social media addiction, all this stuff that are contributing to those mental health effects. And the thing that I mainly focus on is the environment 
that we live in, the social environment that is now normal yeah. of more online interaction than in-person interaction. And humans, like the bio biology of humans are not designed for that in the slightest. Mm -hmm. And social media as, so, so for example, social connection and human connection is a human need like eating. You know, like we need to drink water, we need to eat food, and we need to have social connection. We all learned that during COVID. Yep. Yep. And we really felt that pressure during COVID. Not only being able to go on Zoom with our loved ones, you know, that's insane. So that being said, it is crucial for our mental health to get that human connection. Yes. And right now, we as an entire society, especially as an entire generation, like you're saying, this age group is suffering so deeply yep. with our mental health, is we as an entire generation have been tricked into thinking that, you know, the, the interaction we get on this black box in our room alone is equivalent to the same thing as if we went and got a dinner date with one of our good friends. Yeah. We think that that's the same or that, that, that itches that need that human deep seated human need evolutionary desire. Yeah. And so that it, that being normal, it's basically like we're getting a constant drip of junk food instead mm -hmm. of eating three nice meals a day. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like if someone eats McDonald's five times a day for th four years, let's say in their developmental years, even it's even worse for your health in your developmental years. Let's say you eat McDonald's straight for four years, you know, or, or half your meals are McDonald's your health is going to suffer. Hmm. And the thing is like we people, there's people out there who think McDonald's is food. It's not, but certain people know certain people don't. But with this social media is it's, it's basically you're putting food in your mouth yeah. in the form of social or whatever, yeah. but it's completely void of all nutrients. Right. Cheap calories. So you're, you're basically, yeah, no, you're not satiating that real human need for hunger or, or like nutrients, you know, yeah. cause the reason you're hungry is to put nutrients in your body and your muscles and your organs to live. And the, re you know, so, but when you use this weird capitalistic version of food or this weird capitalistic version of socializing, that's really just there to addict you, keep your presence on there to make money off of your eyes. Yeah. Like when you are con constantly consuming that it's not good for your health and you're, you're say you're like distracting yourself from the real need, but not truly getting the nutrients you need. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a real big part of why our social or our um, mental health is suffering so much because we think that we're so connected and we look on paper and we're like, we're supposed to be connected, but I feel so lonely. It's not even funny. Yeah. I feel like I know no one, no one knows me. I never, you know, am really with anybody. And so that I think is what is torturing our mental, our isolation and our connectedness and our depression. And then the constant comparison, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's all kind of in this soup. But I think that's a big thing is we don't know that it's happening to us or why it's happening to us because we think we're eating, but we're not getting full, you know? So I, I think that's one of the main reasons, but sorry, to, your question was about fixing that. So how can you regulate this thing that we've been addicted to by all these corporations, right? Like we didn't ask for this content, social media addiction, just given to us. Right. So one of the things that, first of all, not saying everybody has to do this, but getting a flip phone completely changed my perspective on a smartphone. Mm. So not saying that you have to get a flip phone, but if there's any period in your day that you can try to not bring your phone to say the gym or not bring your phone to the, you know, go on a walk in the morning without your phone, something like that, that helps just get your body, your nervous system, your, your brain th that's used to this dopamine drip. Like that can help a lot for the first two hour of your day. Don't go on your phone while you're doing your morning routine. That's a huge thing. You know, don't, don't wake up and grab your phone immediately. That's like immediately setting your entire day up for needing that dopamine. Yes. And then I would say as you're weaning yourself off of it, cause you have to wean yourself. You can't go cold Turkey. Mm. It, it, you can, but it's, it doesn't work as well. Yeah. I would say first step, turn off notifications. So that shifts from a buzz in your pocket, putting you on your phone because you can't help, but, you know, pick it up after you get the buzz to then you choose when you want to engage in social media, at least, you know, you never get notified about it. You go on it when you want to go on it. 
So that's a, a big thing that you can do as a, as a first step. And then another thing after that is delete scrolling apps. So mm. unless it's connected to your career or something like that, like Twitter, TikTok, like those are things you open up YouTube, you know, you open up and you, you scroll on it just to get that entertainment, try deleting it for a little while, see how that goes for you. Cause that's just mindless time you're wasting, you know? Yeah. And then after that, you can move into things like trying to not go on your phone for a whole day. You run into a lot of problems with that because you need your phone for a menu or you need your phone for two factor authentication mm. or you need it, but just experiment for yourself in that way. But those, those easy steps are a good way to start. Wow. You brought up things that I didn't even think of the two factor authentication. And you know, we've become so accustomed to being able to be available to anyone at a moment's notice that I even, for, for instance, I knew you were coming on. And so this week I've been practicing pulling myself further away from my phone. I put my phone and my charger in a separate room now and went to bed and I literally went to bed and I was like, but what if someone calls and there's an emergency in the middle of the night? That was my thought. No one's ever called for an emergency in the middle of the night before, but I'm like, now yeah. that it's removed, I'm creating all these like anxious spin up scenarios of like what can happen. I'm like, dang, this thing has control over me, not the opposite. And so it was really convicting. Um, and definitely something I need to continue working on. Do you still have a flip phone? Uh, so I do. Okay. I I don't. So I have a I have an iPhone that I use on a day to day basis. Okay. For for a few reasons because it's not super. Now that I'm moving into adulthood, it's not super sustainable to have a flip phone, mm. especially where I'm at um, and just operating in society. Mm. So I I because everybody has a phone and very few people are going to get a flip phone and my message is not to eliminate them, but to learn how to live in, you know, in congruence with our phones. If that makes yes. Sense. Yes. So because that's my message, I choose to practice having a smartphone and ha how to navigate it. So for example, I, I am super addicted to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I, in a little addicted Instagram, but mostly YouTube is my main tech addiction. And so I use that as an experiment tool to not completely remove myself from everything society is experiencing. Mm -hmm. And also I've grown up with it. YouTube is my tele, YouTube is my TV. YouTube is my movies. YouTube is my, you know, that's all growing up. That's my pop culture basically. Yeah. So, um, so I, want to learn. And I'm, I've been working on this for a long time. Just kind of like I did the whole flip phone thing for me. That's the easy way out. I want to learn how to work out my muscles of being in control of my phone. Wow. And that's what I'm trying to do. And then eventually teach that to other people. However, I do have a flip phone here that I got last week, um, to practice different kinds of detoxes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to eventually, once I get my curriculum together, my plan, my guide together, I'm going to figure out a plan for going on a 24 hour detox from my phone entirely, mm. see what problems I run into, see what happens. Then I'm going to go on a three day detox, then a seven day detox, just see what happens. So that's my plan for that. So I technically have a flip phone, but I don't use it every day. Okay. No, I love that. But clearly you're trying to establish that it's not one crutch versus the other crutch. It's being able to walk <laughs> two feet to use the example with both. So yeah, I think, yes. I think that's brilliant. Um, I want to go to this phenomenon that has happened, mm -hmm. especially for your generation. And I definitely have fallen prey to it as well. Everything needs to be recorded. Everything needs to be pictures taken. You, if there's no picture, there's no proof that it happened why do we have this desire to prove anything? What is this obsession with pushing content of ourselves out into the ether? So it's, I think it's a conceptual uh, battle. So for example, you, you get in your head that you, you get this idea that, oh, this would be so, this ice cream would be so good. Like it would be so delicious. Like you know, if I, if I got this cookies and cream, it would be so nice. You picture it in your head, you picture yourself eating it, then you eat it and it's like, it's good. But then your stomach hurts afterwards, yes, you know, but yeah. you, you love that, like, we love that idea of eating it. It's like, almost like that's where all the dopamine comes from. Yeah. It doesn't even come from eating it. That's actually a scientific fact. Mm -hmm. You get more dopamine from thinking about eating the sugar 
before you actually eat it than you do when you're actually eating it. So crazy? I think there's a little bit of that where we get in our heads, oh, this awesome thing is happening right in front of me. Like, how awesome would it be if I filmed it and then posted it and everybody else could see it? And we just think like, and then I'll remember it forever. And if I ever want to go back to it, I'll, I'll remember it. And it'll be, and I'll have this video forever. And it's like this idea that like, I'll have it forever. Everyone else will get to see it and they'll experience how awesome this is. But really what happens is you end up taking yourself out of the moment so you don't enjoy it because you're filming it. Mm -hmm. And then when you actually film it, it doesn't look nearly as fun as it actually is to you. And also like you just kind of, you never go back and really look at the video. Like sometimes, but like once in a blue moon, you really actually go back through your camera roll and look at this random video you took of this one night on the beach, you know, like maybe once a year, I'll go through a crazy scroll in my camera roll, just like look at my whole life. But like most of the time we don't do any of those things. And then we just end up taking ourselves out of the moment. And then it's also an addiction to having people approve of our lives. Mm. So that's a, a thing that we've gotten used to is, oh, look at how much fun I'm having everybody on my social media. Look how cool my life is. And then that person that watches that then finds themselves in another moment. They're like, well, they were having such a fun time. Let me show them how much fun I'm having. Mm. And so it's this chain reaction waterfall effect that we've had in our generation where now it's just totally normal that everyone has to put their lives on social media or they're not participating in life because every the way everybody's participating in life is by showing everybody else through social media. So if you're not, what are you doing? What? Are you, but I've met a lot of people pre- recently, especially because all the people I surround myself with are the people in my clubs and the people interested in my clubs and all that. So I have a lot of these conversations, but I met this guy who was like, you know, honestly, I just, I used to do the whole take pictures because I want to remember things, but Recently, I've just not taken pictures, enjoyed it in the moment, and it's way better. Mm. Because certain things, like, okay, you go to Disney, take some pictures, all right? Take some pictures with fam, that, you know, do that. Yeah. But if, you, if you're taking it for social media and you're not taking it for yourself for the memory. For example, I went to Europe this past summer. I took a ton of pictures the whole time, but I, I still haven't posted any of them on my social media. When normally, like, everybody that goes to Europe, they're like, oh, I can't wait to post this on Instagram. Look how cool I look. I'm in, I'm in Italy or whatever. But I'm just like, I'm taking these for myself. Yeah. And that was the intention. Mm-hmm. It wasn't to take the media. So there, there is a shift in just living your life versus playing into the whole social media addiction. Because, you know, you find yourself scrolling through everybody's Snapchat story and they're all having fun doing these cool things. You're like, what am I doing? You know? Mm-hmm. And then that drives people to post on their stories, but. Yeah. I mean, everything that you're saying is so profound and, you know, so I was just in Disney world last week and, uh, the happily ever after show, which is an iconic fireworks show in magic kingdom. This struck a chord with me and maybe it's because I was further back from the castle for the time this show, um, whenever the show started, the amount of grown adults i'm talking 40s 50s blocking my view recording the 18 minute fireworks show in video oh i I mean there were way less people without a phone up than there were otherwise and i remember i actually was like i had so many emotions i was angry i was also so grieved because I was like, you're missing it. You, and, and I knew from personal experience because when I went to a Justin Bieber concert, like in 2015, I took pictures the whole time. I don't remember a dang thing from that concert. And I was like, let that be my lesson. Never doing that again. But mm-hmm. it, it's just this crazy concept of we really are missing the moment. And I have to give a shout out to my husband who, when he, he listens to everything you just said, he will be shouting your praises sean because he created uh, a family rule for us which is really such a good idea of anytime we go on a trip let's not post about it until we return Mm. because if we're posting about it while it's happening we're literally pulling ourselves out of the moment for somebody else to see to give us what a dopamine hit when the dopamine is all around us already like it it's so crazy and it's 
I just want better for all of us. I think that's, that's, we both just want everything to be better for all of us. 100%. And there was this interesting uh, phenomenon that I witnessed the other day. And I want to get your thoughts on this because I have my own approach, but um, I lead the host team at my church. And essentially what that means is we try and find who we believe are new guests that enter the church and try and have a conversation the same way that someone who walks into your home, you want to know they're walking into your home so that they don't feel alone and they feel welcome, you know? So I, I saw someone leaning against a wall, texting like this and just like had their head down. You could tell super nervous. They don't really want to talk to anyone. So what did I do? I went up and talked to them and my goal is pull them away from their phone. Not, not deliberately saying like, get off your phone, you know, but I went up and I said, Hey, I like your sweater. Boom. Right. Right. And she was like, Oh, thank you. I was like, my name's Zoe. What's your name? And then we start having a conversation from there. I know that everybody actually believes that they're awkward when it comes to interacting with strangers for the first time. What would your advice or your approach be? If you're trying to have a conversation with someone new, you're not with your phone. Therefore, you're trying to experience the world and someone is currently on their phone, but you want to try and have a conversation with them. What would you do? So there's a few things. There's a few things you can do. And I I like that approach for sure is just ignoring the fact that they're on their phone at all. And then just going up and be like, hi, like what's that? Like, I love your compliment is a great strategy. I would say another thing, because I think I run into a lot is like what after you do that, and maybe it's different for that interaction with you, but sometimes I'll try to do that. And then someone will be like, oh yeah, they'll answer, they'll say thanks. And then they'll just go back directly down. back to their phone. Yeah. Like it's really tough. The handshake is a great strategy because it forces them <laughs> to take their hands off their phone. Exactly. They can't go straight back. It's great. But um, I would say I like inviting people into something fun. So whether it's a fun discussion about something stupid. So if you're like, you know, I've been thinking recently, like, I think that, you know, I think that pepperoni pizza is like way better than hamburgers or something stupid like that. That's kind of a bad example, but like, you know, like invite them into a dumb debate yeah. or something like that. Like if you had to eat one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Like ask them a stupid question, you know, and then they could e- either, they have to answer, you know, it's not like they, so then they have to kind of like set their phone down and think they're like, Hmm, what phone, what, what, or what, uh, you know, what, what food would I eat for the rest of my life? And then from there, you can kind of like latch on and like joke with them. And then eventually, hopefully they'll, they'll choose you over their phone, but sometimes they still go back. But you, so something like, like if you could have one superpower, what would it be? You know, or something like that, or what's your favorite, what's your favorite blank? You know, what's your favorite, that's a more flimsy one, but asking like a stupid question that has a lot of fun answers, you know, to it that you guys could then talk about I feel like it's good because then you have a topic rather than just like hey let's have a conversation about what hi (laughs) you know like yeah no kind of you have that topic right away yeah absolutely and one thing that Sean's saying here and making clear is that you should not ask a yes or no question because obviously that's going to fall flat and Mm. finding ways to get people to have creative answers about something is absolutely key and so brilliant and beautifully said my favorite question to actually ask people is what's your biggest passion sean what is your biggest passion my biggest passion is creating a world where we it is normal for people to be aware when they're out of the moment and be aware when they're in the moment Mm -hmm. and go between both in a balanced fashion for example like if you were in if you're at Disney and everyone's watching the fireworks show and there is one fireworks show or one period of the fireworks show where you take a video and then the rest of the fireworks show, Disney announces, now we're all going to be present, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Yes. Where it's normal. The awareness of being present and not being present is normal. And that it is a commonplace thing that we all understand because we have these new things called phones that have this effect on us where it takes us out of the moment. And that we're aware that it is important to be in the moment and it's important to use these devices for the utility and the tool that it is while balancing being in real life and in the digital world. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you have said on other podcasts, you've talked about how little you are on social media day. And I say this because I just read, there's a study that the average teenage girl, they were specifically doing, spends seven hours a day on social media. Mm -hmm. To contrast that, how much time do you spend on social media a day or a week, Sean? Let me expose myself. I'm going to pull out my screen time. Look at this honesty I, here. I tell you what, I am not a saint about this, really. Like there was a week where I fell down hard and I was just scrolling so much. Like YouTube, like I said, is my thing. Yeah. I think I spent like 10 hours in one day, like on my phone. And I'm being honest about that because that's yeah. how it is. Thank you. And I don't want to paint myself as some like, oh, I'm never on my phone. So let me go to my, um, let me go to my screen time. Bear with me. I actually don't. I started checking. Okay, here we go. My daily average is four and a half hours. Okay. And my high this week was, let's see where, oh, it doesn't tell me. Yeah, my daily average is four and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So there you go, guys. I'm exposed. But there's a distinction here because if you're having YouTube on, you can listen to YouTube the same way you listen to a podcast. So True. are you spending four and a half hours scrolling? Like what, what's happening here? How, how have you learned to have strike a healthy dichotomy with it? Well, I think that one of the things that I've noticed, I do listen to like podcasts on YouTube while I'm driving or sometimes when I'm at the gym, stuff like that. So that could be part of it. Yeah. But I, the thing that I've discovered for myself is the, the level of dopamine releasing activity that I go that I that I do on my phone. So for example, wow. if we have the lowest level of dopamine releasing activity being listening to lo-fi music mm -hmm. while studying or something like that. Like that's pretty low level dopamine releasing, still stimulating your brain in a certain way. And then if we look at the highest being scrolling on reels. Scrolling on reels <laughs> is like so much dopamine to the face. It's like so addicting yeah. and like, you know, pleasure centers, all that. So if I wake up in the morning and I start scrolling on reels, likely for the rest of that day, I will scroll through reels in my downtime. Yeah. And, and then that'll eat away at my time, eat away at my day. And so if I slowly kind of like, if I, if I hold off on that type of activity mm -hmm. for the beginning of the day, normally throughout the rest of the day, it'll be much easier for me to stay away from my phone. Mm. So that's another thing that I, I have learned actually Yet yesterday and the day before, I because I'm in this fight too, you know. Yeah. Was that when I start off my day, I'm like, oh, you know what? I'll just watch some videos while I'm eating breakfast. You know, that sets me off for the whole day. So if you if you do a really dopamine releasing thing, the first thing you, you in your day, it, it it'll it'll be harder to pull yourself away, because, yeah, I mean, it's like if you eat a five star five course meal for breakfast and then you have mcdonald's for lunch it's like yeah. your your pleasure centers just can't like they don't respond the same way yeah and and they probably they probably could stop but by that point you don't believe you can stop and yeah. and everything that sean's saying is actually rooted in science like dr andrew huberman talks about this and how it impacts your sleep the blue light that comes off your eyes in the morning literally ruins your circadian rhythm for the following night and he actually recommends mm -hmm. don't touch your phone for the first 90 minutes after you wake up. And at that 90 minute mark, that's when you can start drinking coffee. <laughs> if you're a coffee drinker, because that's when the caffeine actually works best is once you've been up after getting direct sunlight in your eyes first Ooh. thing in the morning. So yeah, yeah, I think that's extremely valuable insight there, Sean. And I want to make a distinction. Sean did not say he spends four and a half hours on social media a day. He said four and a half hours screen time. So I think that's an important distinction so that people aren't like, oh, so he's on for five hours a day. No, he's calling people that impacts the screen time, which I actually want to talk about next. You started this thing where your entire friend group only calls. Now, when people call me, I think it's an emergency. I think something's wrong. I don't know how I got this way because I also, being a millennial, I've experienced half my life where phone calls we're normal. So how have you made this a thing in your friend group <laughs> and offset that fear for people that is this, is something wrong? Is it an emergency? Yeah. You have to do it. 
You just have to do it. And you can speak to it for sure. If you, if you tell someone like, but sometimes like if you just do it and then people see that it's normal, mm. a lot of times, especially if you have cool friends, they'll just be like, Oh, cool. Nice. When Sean calls me, I know that he's just calling me because that's what he does, he you know? To talk. And then maybe they feel inspired to call someone else and call their friend like, Oh, this is normal. So one of the things I used to do when I, I'm in this huge group chat with all my friends. So when we would be trying to play ultimate Frisbee together or something like that, I would go through every single person in the group chat and I would just call everyone one or two times. Wow. <laughs> like, t- like, Hey, you coming to ultimate Frisbee? Hey, you coming to ultimate Frisbee? Like everyone, I just give everyone a call. And so once, once I started doing that, people like first time, fewer people answered second time more people answered and it just kind of people just get it and then so another thing that i do at all my club meetings is at the end of each meeting especially the first meeting it's an important thing to do i encourage people so i hand everybody their phones back i give them the bag they like grab their phones and i say all right guys last step of the meeting anyone that you met today that you really connected with that you enjoyed This is how we're going to stay connected Mm. because remember this generation, our only experience of staying connected is Snapchat, social media, all this stuff. So to, to, to combat that, to challenge that, I say, all right, guys, anyone you connected with, you want to stay connected with, get their phone number. Now's your chance. And you're only allowed to call them out of the blue. No texting, no Snapchat, nothing. You're only allowed to give them a call out of the blue and they'll know that it's from you trying to connect because you met them at Reconnect and this is why you're doing it. So it's not like it's an emergency because this person's calling you. You know they're just calling to talk to you. Yeah. And we, it's it's really important to normalize that because texting is is not a good form of communication for connection. It's a great form of communication for yes, no, I'm on my way, 30 minutes, yeah, cool. But as far as like having a depth conversation, mm-hmm. phone call is all the way. And personally, I like to phone call for everything just because it's easier with inf- voice inflection and tone yep. of voice yep. and conversation. You get more connection across through the phone than you do through texting. So there's less room for like assumptions and stuff like that. But those are some ways that I combat it. Just call your friends, call them. And they did a breakdown on this. And when it comes to communication, uh, 7% is the words that you say. 30% is your tone. And the remainder is your body language. So a phone call beats texting, beats messaging any dang day of the week. But mm-hmm. you know what beats that even more? Human connection in person. And so, Sean, I love what you're doing because even that right there, you have such a heart to see people and make them feel seen. And (laughs) when we're in a society where everyone wants to feel seen and you're actually doing it and it, it breaks kind of that, that rhythm of people are lit in of thinking that feeling seen means likes or feeling seen means being recognized. No feeling and being seen is someone wanting to get to know your heart, everything about you, the best parts, the worst parts, the honest parts, you know, like that is true, beautiful human connection. And so I just love that so much. And I hope this has been an eye opening conversation for people to listen into because you want more of you <laughs> in this world. We all want more Sean's in this world who are actually bringing us back to the, what, what do you call it? Not the opposite of the wasteland. What do you call that? forward into balance and the savannah is what we call it savannah yes and we are replanting the savannah in a digital wasteland yes that see that's so poetic right there and so i would love for you to kind of close by giving an encouragement and just so anything that's on your heart to help the rest of us who may not be in your generation who have been very enlightened by the struggles that you're going through of how we can better see all of you well i would say um, there might be some parents listening and i would say to parents that the biggest difference and it's really hard to to get because a lot of this content of phones put down your phone you know a lot of this content goes into 
well, just get off your dang phone, youngin. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. And I think that the the shift that is really important as for understanding is that what you guys grew up in, like when you were going on your dinner dates 10 years ago, even though, even though Facebook was coming into play, it was a different world mm-hmm. than it is now. Mm-hmm. And when you guys grew up, when you guys grew up and you went to high school and you, the experience you had that is just in your head, you, you know, you, you were, you were there, you did it. That was what the world was. That is the, the it's like unrecognizable to what that was mm-hmm. now, like present day. Um, let me drop this on y'all. Kids do not go on in-person dates. Dates do not, are not how you get to know someone. Mm-hmm. Uh, getting to know a friend is oftentimes through Snapchat, which is an app on your phone where you text essentially with pictures. Like I am being serious and it is, it's atrocious. It's horrible for connecting. It's, it's not real. And so when you're a kid, it, let's say you have a kid in high school, your kid is not experiencing. So when you, when you're a parent and I'm just, I'm not a parent, but I'm assuming when you're looking at your kid, Oh, my kid's in high school. You know, I know kind of what they're going through right now because you're calling back to when you were in high school. Mm. It's really important to make the distinction that when you're calling back to what you were experiencing in high school, that that ecosystem for connection and making friends and that environment that you lived in for everything, for hanging out with your friends, for connection, that environment no longer exists. That all those memories you have of staying up late with your friends and talking and going on doing crazy stuff around your town or what your neighborhood or whatever, none of that happens anymore. And I'm seeing serious, nothing like that happens. It is a wasteland of being stuck on your phone. When you go to class, no one's talking. Everyone is on their phone waiting for the teacher to start talking. The teacher starts talking. Everyone's silent. No one's passing notes, talking, making jokes. Everyone's silent leave the classroom. Everyone walks out of the classroom on their phone. So I think for an older generation to understand the true level of systemic isolation that we're experiencing, Mm -hmm. it is not that these kids just want these phones so bad they won't get off them, you know, and they're this and that. It's like, no, these massive corporations addicted an entire generation to a drug that is using our, you know, biological brain. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, we're all completely isolated. And I have been fighting to get us systemically out of it. And that is what I'm doing. And that's the reason I'm here is to, to, to alter that and to replant the Savannah. So we are living in a wasteland. You grew up in a Savannah, lucky you, but it is completely different. And it, I think your kid would really appreciate if you maybe talk, ask them questions about it and just ask for their perspective of what they experience and just know that you don't get it in a way mm. w- without taking that the wrong way, you know, cause you can't. Yeah. Well, that actually uh, brought me to tears, Sean, and I'm not a parent myself. So, um, I know we're new friends, but I just want to say that I'm really proud of you. Uh, Thank you so because much. you are making this world a better place and I can't wait to keep cheering you on. And I know that there's a lot of us now that can't wait to keep cheering you on. So where can people connect with you and follow along on this reconnect journey? Absolutely. Amazing. So my main social media presence, online presence is the reconnect movement on Instagram. I haven't changed the reconnect movie yet. I'm not fully Mark Zuckerberg, (laughs) you know, I'm still still in my formative times, but it is the reconnect movement on Instagram. And I also have a podcast you can find on Spotify. That one is called reconnect podcast. And yeah, that is those are, and also I have a website as well where you can find information, examples like my my Pachaka Shaw talk, similar to like kind of a TED talk is on there as well. That is thereconnectmovement.com. So you can go there. It has our message. It has all other information. And as we release merchandise, that'll be on there as well. And yeah, those are my my three spots. No, I, I love that. And first off, you guys have to listen to his talk. It literally is a TED level talk. And I told him before we started recording, I said, in the next two years, my friend, this is actually going to be a TED talk. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's awesome. We're going to have all the links below. And I'm actually coming on his podcast soon too. We're flipping it sure. around. He's putting me in the hot seat. So uh, we'll put that. Oh yeah. <laughs> so we'll put the link to that in there too. Um, Sean, 
thank you so much for all that you're doing. Exactly. The hope that you infuse the world with and how you are actively working to build a community and a world that is so much better. We're grateful for you, my friend. So thanks.